All right, what is up, guys? It is Stormback here with another video, and in this one, I am bringing you part 29 to the New Dawn and Naruto slash Boruto story. Now, if you want to check this story out for yourself, the link to it will be down in the description below. But before the video begins, if you like the content you're seeing, be sure to subscribe, like, and comment. I mean, they're all free, so why not? If you want some dope channel merch, the link to that will be down in the description below. And if you want to see more of me, be sure to go check out my other channels and go follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, which will all be linked down below. But without further ado, why don't we just dive right on in? Boruto looked down upon the valley from his hiding spot amongst an old goat trail high in the mountains. They had finally reached the Sugawara faction. Tetsu had been as good of a guide as he had promised. Now the three of them beheld the fruits of their labor. The Sugawara faction was not in hiding, as rumor would have it. They were under siege. A stronghold of stone sat high in the mountains. Flag bearing the symbol of the land of rain flying proudly. Below that, a flag bearing their sigil. The blossom of a plum tree with a single feather. It was an old stronghold. High walls, thick doors, one entrance in and one exit out. Boruto's eyes faded from blue to a pale lavender. With his Byakugan, he could see patrols manning the ramparts. They were armed with swords on their hips and a bow and quiver on their backs. They dressed in old but well-maintained armor. The steel had been dyed a dark blue to the motif of the rain. And all up and down the valley were war tents and earthen domes. They flew the same rain flag, but their sigil was different. A wolf, its maw gapping as if to snap. Men, armored in armor that had been dyed red, marched in an orderly fashion. They too had a watch. Men with torches walking in pairs around the perimeter. What's going on? Boruto whispered. The Oromura clan, Tetsu gritted out. They are powerful allies of the Mononobe. Ah, Boruto thought. Allies of the people who slew his master. From the way the samurai was gripping a sword's hilt. Boruto pitied the men that would surely die in the coming weeks. Tetsu was going to slaughter them. Perhaps Boruto would help him with his task? How do we get past them? I doubt the Sigawara clan is going to let us waltz in their front gate, Hikari hissed back. Also true. They were as likely to be speared as greeted. Boruto would be paranoid too if there was an army camped in front of his home, so they couldn't go in through the front doors, and sneaking in through the back wouldn't earn them any favors. What to do then? As fate would have it, the drums of war began to beat. Men formed rank, their red armor shining in the dull light of day. Standard bearers marched at the front, next to young boys beating drums. They marched forward, their boots falling with the beat. On the ramparts, archers flooded into position. Their bows were drawn, arrows knocked. The large wooden doors parted, and men in blue armor sprinted to get into formation. The first row of men had thick square shields. The men behind them held long spears with vicious pointed heads. There were hundreds of them. Thousands, maybe. And they were going to war. Boruto leapt to his feet and hurled himself over the boulder he had been hiding behind. The old goat path they were hiding on was high in the mountains, but a little chakra made his descent a controlled one. Behind him, he heard Hikari curse under her breath and leap after him. He could hear Tetsu's boots crush stone underfoot as he followed them down the battlefield. The air was filled with a whistling sound. Arrows. Then came the screams. They were loud. So loud. The wails of the dead and dying. Those who were not fortunate enough to die instantly lay on the cold stone ground, and slowly bled to death. Boruto swallowed hard, filling a pit well up in his stomach. This is what they came to the land of rain to be a part of. War. He crushed the rising disgust he felt and skidded to a stop. He was far behind enemy lines. He could see the red and blue armored men clashing to his left. Several hundred feet of chaotic melee separated him from their would-be allies. Behind him, Boruto heard Hikari and Tetsu arrive. He heard the telltale rustle of cloth as Hikari withdrew a fistful of needles, and the chime of metal as Tetsu drew his sword. Boruto weaved hand seals. There was a shout of surprise and fear. A man in the enemy army had noticed them. He was yelling frantically pointing at them and jumping up and down. Too late. Boruto spat a wave of cascading water upon the army's flank. The closest were struck hard enough to be knocked unconscious. Those farther out were swept off their feet and sent careening into their comrades next to them. The valley was angled as such that the water flooded downhill. 
impeding the invading army. Men armored in heavy steel boots slipped and fell. They struggled to regain their footing under the weight of their armor and weapons. Then, the surprise ended. The army turned their attention to the new foes within their ranks. Swords and spears brandished with angry shouts and battle cries. An armored man leapt at them, wielding a spear with the banner of the Orimura clan just below the spearhead. Tetsu cut him in twine, from left shoulder to right hip. The next, Takari peppered with two needles. He dropped to the ground, screaming and convulsing and clawing at his neck. The three after that, Borta spat a blade of water at them. It cut through their armor with ease. Their armor once dyed a pleasant shade of red, turned crimson with blood. A water jutsu cut through the air, forcing the three of them to leap out the way. A rain ninja, perhaps. He used water release, water bullet jutsu. It was weak. The bullets were no wider than Boruto's thumb was, and their quantity was nowhere near enough to catch any one of them. They were all just too fast. The ninja screamed angrily, his face contorted in rage. Tetsu was upon him but an instant. The samurai cleaved him in half, from left hip to right. There wasn't any room for jutsu. Men in red armor were everywhere, to the left, to the right, in front, and behind. It devolved into a melee. Boruto lashed out, chakra lancing from his fingertips. It pierced their armor with ease. The first two came at him, swords arsing downwards. He stepped to the side, and thrust his chakra into their bodies where he thought their hearts were. It must have worked, because they dropped to the ground and began to claw at their armored chests. After a few moments, they stilled. Hikari was in front of him, dancing between swords and spears, hurling wave after wave of throwing needles at her opponents. Sometimes they would scream, sometimes they just fell to the ground and were silent. Tetsu had waded deep into the enemy lines, swinging his sword with practiced ease and clear skill. Every swing of his sword, a man fell dead, sometimes two. They rushed him, angry and fearful. They thrust spears at the mountain of a man. He cut the heads from the shafts. They tried to best him at swordplay. They failed. Another group charged at Boruto. They fell to the gentle fist. There was a flash of silvery steel among the red armor. A headband. Stone ninja. His fists were encaved in stone gauntlets. He swung at him. Boruto ducked. The gauntlet crushed the hauberk of an armored man behind him. Boruto prodded the stone ninja five times in the ribs. He fell to the ground. And did not rise. For ten minutes. It was nothing but a sea of red armor being crushed under the weight of hundreds of years of refined gentle fist taijutsu. Ikari was breathing hard, her crimson tide fatigues damp with sweat, and cut in several places. She had retreated, fighting at range with her needles in the occasional precise water jutsu. Tetsu had tired and was slowly pushed back by the tides of red armored men. In the end, it was the three of them, back to back. Then the blue armor began to mix with red. A man in blue armor with a horned helmet sprinted over to them. You three, retreat back to the castle, he yelled, over the dull roar of battle. Boruto was only too happy to follow the command. He, Hikari, and Tetsu worked their way back to the ranks of the Sugawara forces. The armored men parted, allowing them to pass. Boruto saw a handful of them nod respectfully as they brandished their swords and charged forward. Two even bowed to them. The three of them walked through the towering double doors of the stronghold, and were ceremoniously ferried away by a contingency of servants and squires. Yes, young master. No, young master. I do not know, young master. That was all Boruto got out of the servants that had herded him and Tetsu down to the bowels of the castle. Hikari had been taken by a gaggle of giggling maids. They learned the hard way that separating the three of them was a lesson in pain. Hikari snapped the maid's wrist to try to pull her away. They had to stop and explain they were taking them to the baths before she would relent and accompany them. The Sugawara castle was an amalgam of the old and the new. It was old stone, probably built by the ancient people of the land of Earth many hundreds of years ago. But Borto could tell that, over the years, it had been renovated and upgraded several times. There were modern lights bolted into the ceiling, and there had been heavy masonry work done on the floors and walls to allow for running water. But the baths were not modern, in a good way. The bowels of the castle had been hollowed out, and the miners had unearthed the natural hot spring. Whatever plans the castle had called for had been abandoned in favor of building an expensive set of ornate open-air baths that were naturally warm all year round. 
It was a godsend after weeks in the wilderness and sleeping in dingy, drafty inns and taverns. Not as good as the hot springs in the land of steam, but they were still good. The water was a pleasant temperature. Not too hot, not too cold. The water was scented. A pleasant herbal scent. The water was recycled through a pair of ornate gilded lions that had been carved out of a beautiful white stone. The only thing marrying the occasion was the servants who awkwardly sat and watched him bathe. Borto tried to make pleasant small talk, but they were as forthcoming as a rock. Tetsu was the redeeming aspect of their little quest. He stared down the servants with a stony, piercing gaze that made them visibly uncomfortable and fidget. That was their punishment for their silence. About halfway through washing his hair of dirt and grime, there was a shrill shriek followed by a wail of pain. The women's bath, apparently, was only separated by a thin wall of ornately carved stone pillars. Don't touch the mask, Hikari screamed. Borto laughed. The maids would learn, or they would suffer. Given that he himself had yet to coax Hikari to reveal her true face, Borto doubted a handful of maids would. He just hoped she didn't do any permanent damage to the help. They wanted to make a good impression, after all. After the bath came the tailors. Boruto was given a dark blue colored yukata with rippled wave patterns, while the tailors had to fashion something large enough to fit Tetsu's impressive frame. Then the two of them were led back into the castle and up into the higher levels. Boruto couldn't suppress a giggle. The tailors had visited Ikari. Somehow, by the grace of God, they had managed to get her into a floral kimono that, through some sorcery, complemented her mist hunter mask. By the icy anger reflected in her green eyes, Boruto knew that Akari hated every single second she was in the garment. Another thought, and I'll castrate you in the night, Akari hissed at him. Boruto stopped laughing. So, he said, I guess the boss is behind that door, huh? Hikari gazed at the gilded metal doors that separated the three of them from what they presumed was the leader of the Sugawara clan. I would imagine so, she said, eyeing the gold trim with distaste. Your assumption would indeed be correct, Tetsu commented stoically. Boruto nodded. Tetsu would know the customs of the Land of Rain. Perhaps every politician lavished their guests like the Sugawara clan. Boruto doubted it. The doors cracked open revealing two armored guards with swords in their waists and spears in their hands. And Tetsu was right. The lord of the Sugawara clan was not what Boruto was expecting. He was an older man, perhaps in his mid to late fifties. He'd appeared long enough to function as a scarf that was a gray silver color. He was balding, but had two thick eyebrows framing his eyes that gave him an intimidating presence. Unlike most powers that Boruto had met, the man had retained a healthy weight. Boruto could see the waning muscles of youth in his arms. A former soldier for the Rain Lord, perhaps? He was interesting. He commanded respect, even from Boruto. Something that was impressive, considering his blatant lack of respect for authority and the law. Greetings, the man said. His voice was deep and baritone. It seemed to echo throughout the hall impressively. He sat at the head of a low set table, a number of luxurious cushions acting as seats. I am Michizane Sugawara. My men tell me that they almost surely would have suffered great losses if not for you three. But that begs the question, who are you? And where did you come from? The three of them shared a look. Tetsu was ever silent, and Boruto thought it best that Hikari speak for them. This was her plan, after all. We are wandering mercenaries, searching for a cause, my lord, she said. Boruto caught the slight distaste that she used when spitting the word, my lord. And do these mercenaries have names? Hikari, Tetsu, Nagato, Boruto answered. Of the three, he was the only one that would warrant international attention. Hikari was wanted in the lands of water and lightning, but they were far away. Too far for her name to have spread to the warring land of rain and a minor politician vying for the leadership of the country, so it gave him the name of the second leader of the Akatsuki. Boruto didn't catch Akari's slight flinch at the name's usage. And do you three have surnames? Michizane asked. Boruto remained silent, and so did his friends. Good. I see. Please, sit. Eat. Boruto did. He had survived off rations for the past month, and he was dying to eat a real hot meal. He didn't have to worry about poison. Hikari was immune to most of them, 
and could develop the antidote for those she wasn't. The food wasn't of high quality nor delicacies, but it was of great quantity, which was good in its own twisted sort of way. The people of the Land of Rain dealt with hunger and poverty on a near daily basis. The fact that the Lord of the Sugawara Clan wasn't overly opulent was a point in his favor. He simply had the money to buy food, and lots of it, but he wasn't wasteful, in fact, bored to amused. They were probably eating soldiers' rations right now, just better cooked and prepared. So, what cause brought you to my doorstep? Mijizane asked, taking a sip from a sake cup. Ikari, who would refrain from eating or drinking as it would have required her to remove her mask, answered for them. Boruto would try to steal some food for her to eat later. Rumor has it, among those in the know, that you are a people's champion, she said smoothly. We came to Rain looking for a cause to support. Yours is the most just one. Simple. Mijizane nodded. I'm honored you have considered me as such, but while I'm appreciative of your assistance in our most recent battle, I'm afraid I must decline accepting your services, he said. Borta forgot how to choose, he listened to their host reject them. Was he blind? Did he not see them nearly single-handedly repel a large portion of the army that had marched on his castle? He'd have to be insane to reject them. They were his key to a swift and decisive victory. They were metaphorically his guaranteed inauguration as Rain Lord. Judging from the stern, quiet look Hikari was giving the man, she felt the same. I'm afraid I don't understand your reasoning, she said coolly. I don't trust you, the Lord of the Sigawara clan said. You could be spies, and even if you're not, I have no way of guaranteeing your loyalty to me or to the cause. Powerful you may be, yes, but useful to me? No. I will repay your kind deed with hospitality, but no more. Boruto exchanged a glance with Akari. Their eyes met, trying to convey a silent conversation that only people with years of teamwork could. What do we do? I don't know, you're the experienced one, use that silver tongue. You're the Hokage's son, use your extensive political skills. That, that actually might work. But no, don't even think about it. Too late. Boruto finished eating the chicken breast he'd been chewing on, and formed a single hand seal. His hair, a pleasant dark blue black color, faded and returned to its natural blonde. His matching scars and both cheeks emerged from underneath the fox skin of the transformation jutsu. Boruto took a casual sip of sake and resisted the urge to spit it out. A little liquid courage couldn't help, even if it tasted foul. A look of confusion mirrored mages on his face, followed by realization, then shock, then disbelief. I believe you can safely say we are not spies, Boruto commented tearing off a hunk of bread, and leverage to ensure our loyalty. I assume you know we don't wish to be found. Point made. Boruto formed the seal for the transformation jutsu and resumed his disguise. The bread was really quite good. It was sweeter than the grain used to make it in the land of fire. Out of the corner of his eye, Boruto could see their host lips twitch upwards in interest. Indeed, Michizane said, almost conversationally. But... What is to stop me from informing the Okage of your location and collecting the bounty for your safe return? Boruto frowned. Shouldn't he be listed as a criminal in the bingo books for his actions? Surely the Leaf wasn't offering the same old bounty for his safe return to the village. Because, Hikari said, stepping in and resuming negotiations. He and we are more valuable to you than the pittance of a bounty. You're a rich man, my lord, but for all your wealth, you can't secure the title of Rain Lord. Boruto's bounty won't help you with that. But, Boruto himself could. The three of us could assist you in defeating your rivals, and our loyalty would be assured so long as you remain silent about this. And our true identities. There was a tense silence for a few moments. Boruto slowly chewed his food in disbelief that the man was actually considering their offer. Then he grinned from ear to ear. Very well. I assume you'd like payment beyond what normal rank and file soldiers receive, Michizane asked. Hikari inclined her head, stating that, yes, that they were going to fight. They might as well be paid well. Tetsu looked ill at the prospect of killing for money, as opposed to honor. Boruto would have to talk to him later, ease things over, as it were. What kind of payment do you have in mind? Wealthy as I am, I doubt I could afford the services of the son of the Okage and his companions who are undoubtedly much more skilled and powerful than the average ninja, Michizane said. 
I'm sure there are other things with which you could pay us, Ikari mentioned casually. Sometimes, cold hard Rio wasn't the best form of currency. There was something to be said with having the lord of a country owing you a favor or two. Michizane smiled, a thinly veiled pride emerging from his features. Standard soldiers pay with rights to looting and seniority for any advancement in my hierarchy. Needless to say, there are several things I could offer each of you personally. Storage for the samurai, lessons in politics for the Okage's son, and whatever I could offer to interest a missed hunter ninja, not to mention favors once I am rain lord, he offered. Tetsu, Borata noted, looked much more pleased about the situation when he was offered the chance of plundering the Sugawara clan armory for swords. Borata didn't really care for any political lessons that Michizane could give him, but he'd keep his options open. When the pleas glimmered Akari's green eyes, Borata could tell she found the terms acceptable. We have priority on all ninja tools and scrolls found during the war effort, she amended. Done, Michizane said, raising his cup in agreement. The three of them did the same. It was the start of a beautiful, yet deadly, relationship. Jirata was lost in her thoughts as she listened to her heart hammer in her chest. She was only interrupted because of the sound of her boots upon the stone as she ran through the mountains. She leapt, fingers clutching at a ridge and hauling herself up before she could fall. They had, after much consideration, come to the conclusion that Boruto and Akari had already passed into the Land of Rain. No one in the Land of Rivers had seen a hide nor a hair of them, and it seemed likely that they had simply passed the country with great haste in disguise. So, they were somewhere in the country where it rained nearly every day of the year and was cloaked in perpetual twilight. The perfect search conditions, not. It was decided that their group would cut through the mountains separating the land of wind and rain to avoid the torrential downpour that would make quick travel all but impossible. From there, they would enter the country through the old goat trails and mining roads that had long since been abandoned. Sarada glanced to her left, then to her right. To the left lay the vast expanse of cloudless blue sky and the harsh warm air of the deserts. To the right, the dark storm clouds that rained and rained and rained. It was an eerily beautiful sight. Sarada leapt, crossing a crevice in the stone that was as wide as she was tall. For a moment, she feared her weight would drag her into the abyss. Then, she sailed across. She grunted as her feet touched stone, her combined weight causing them to crack. It was the speed training, courtesy of Lee and his father. She had asked them for a training regiment that focused on speed shortly after leaving the Okage's office the day she had been assigned the mission. They had, quite literally, broken into celebration and held her down as they strapped weights to her legs. She didn't recognize the seals placed on the weights, but from what she had gathered, they had increased their weight over time as the wearer grew stronger. Their only instructions? Run. If she couldn't do 10 miles, she would do 20, running backwards. Strada took creative liberty in her own hands and ran until she couldn't stand. She didn't ever run backwards as punishment for being unable to do their freakishly unnatural feats of strength and endurance. Strada wheezed as she came around the mountain path and saw that their camp was in sight. It was her third lap around the mountain, and she felt dead inside, empty with exhaustion. She was going to curl up, collapse into her sleeping bag, and wake up tomorrow and do it all again. Serata muttered under her breath angrily. A pair of dark-haired heads popped up from a boulder that hid a path down the mountain. Mirai and Chikadai wandered into camp, looking tired, forlorn, and absolutely soaked to the bone. Chikadai shook his head back and forth violently, trying to shake out the water. Apparently, they had gone down to the land of rain while she was out running. Interesting. She came to a skidding stop outside the camp's perimeter. What happened to you two? Sarada asked them as they stripped of their chunin and jonin jackets. Shikadai grumbled something that sounded like, Troublesome damned rain. Mirai sighed audibly. Uh, we went down into a small town near the border, she said. Information gathering. Needless to say, we tried to gather information. Tried? Sarada asked hersely. They were a chunin and a jonin. You didn't try to get information. You succeeded in extracting information. Mirai nodded. Basically, we learn the entire country is in chaos. There is no central political or military authority. There are over a dozen men vying for the title of Rain Lord, and three separate people have claimed to be Amakage, including the bastard daughter of Hanzo the Salamander. Can you believe that? Strata frowned. I didn't know Hanzo had a daughter, she said. Bastard daughter, Mirai corrected. 
Apparently, the old salamander got drunk one night and got a little too friendly with a serving girl. Any information about Boruto? Himori asks, emerging from her tent. Her face was so hopeful that it made Strata's heart clench in sympathy. Shikata shook his head. Uh, nah, he said. The country's in so much chaos that no one cares who comes and goes. Doesn't matter if you're the son of the Okage or the Sage of Six Paths. Strata frowned at Himori's crestfallen expression. We'll just have to search for him, faction by faction, she said with conviction. Naruto slumped into his seat with a sigh. He pushed a tower of old ramen cups into the trash and tried his best to clear his desk of stray paperwork that he had either lost or forgotten about or just didn't care to do. After a few minutes, he managed to clear enough bureaucratic red tape to use his computer's keyboard. With a few keystrokes, he picked up his phone and waited for the call to connect. He didn't have to wait long. His monitor flashed as the familiar visage of his longtime friend appeared. Ah, Gara, Naruto greeted. How are you? Gara sighed heavily. By the way the redhead shoulder slumped, he could tell that he was under a lot of stress. Welcome to the club. It was part of the job description as Kage. Uh, fine. Gara managed to groan. Naruto frowned. Are you alright? He asked, worried. Fine. Gara waved a hand dismissively. Long days trying to convince my council and advisors that we shouldn't do anything to anger the demonic sand Tanuki that roams our land. Naruto sighed. Shukaku still looking for fresh sand? Gara grinned ever so slightly. <laughs> you could say that, he said. Naruto smiled. Glad he could bring some small cheer to his friend. I need to ask you a favor, he said. Anything, Gara replied without hesitation. You remember what I told you about Boruto? Naruto asked. Gara nodded. I just received intel from the group tracking him. They say he's in the land of rain. Naruto didn't miss a slight frown that overtook Gara's features as he heard the name of his neighboring country. There isn't very many places he could go from there, Naruto continued. If you could, I'd appreciate if you could station a team on the border who are loyal to you and can keep a lookout for him, just in case. Gara nodded. I'll have... Naruto frowned as Gara broke into a fit of coughing. It lasted only for a few moments, but the sound was wet and guttural. When his arm came back, Naruto could see that his friend's lips were ever so slightly darker than before. Blood. Uh, I'll have... Kongoro take his team out, Gara said breathily. Shinki has been eager to prove himself since losing to Sasuke's daughter in the tournament. Naruto was torn between frowning at his friend's condition and grinning at Gara's nephew's eagerness. Are you going to be alright, Gara? Naruto asked. I'll be fine, Naruto, Gara assured him. It's the sand. It gets in your lungs if you're not careful. It's just something we deal with here. Naruto didn't frown. Not sure what to think. I have to go, Naruto, Gara said. Goodbye, Gara, Naruto said. Gara nodded. And his screen went dark. I stayed.